The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... The unforgivable sin is the sin that God cannot forgive because you've lost the ability to repent. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. What does the word prophesied mean? Prophesied does not mean you're forecasting the weather or telling the future, guessing, you know, where Elvis is next going to appear, like some of the supermarket tabloid prophets. Prophecy, one of the words, is to preach. In the New Testament, keep in mind, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14, prophecy does not always mean saying, thus saith the Lord and foretelling the future. Prophecy means to speak in behalf of another or to preach the gospel for Christ, okay? Now... With that in mind, what does the Bible say about speaking in a tongue? No, with that in mind, these 12 Ephesian disciples, Luke is there, he speaks one language, Paul is there, he speaks other languages, then there's 12 Ephesian believers there. There's several language groups represented. When they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke with tongues, they were prophesying. That means they were preaching. They understood what they were saying. You see what I'm saying? In all Three examples, when they got the gift of tongues, they recognized that they were speaking, either magnifying God, the wonderful works of God, or prophesying for God, but they understood what was being said. They weren't just there babbling words over and over again. What does the Bible say about speaking in a tongue that is not understood by those that are present? Uh, you'd think that as much as it's done, that God would endorse it. But what does Paul really say in 1 Corinthians 14? Except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now, if that's clear to you, let me hear you say amen. amen. He's, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians, if you're going to talk, make sure those present understand. The reason this is close to my heart, incidentally, this is the first time this lesson has ever been presented publicly. I wrote this lesson because it's a real critical need in the church. There's a lot of confusion. You've probably seen how the gift of tongues and some of the misunderstandings about it are just spreading like fire through all the churches, all the mainline churches. And people kind of sometimes look at you like you're a second-class citizen if you cannot do this babbling in tongues that they call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After I accepted the Lord... Up in my cave, God was working mightily in my life. Remember, when he found me, I was about as far away from God as a person can get. Running around naked up in the mountains with long hair and a beard, eating out of a garbage can, using drugs, cursing, stealing, lying, living immorally. Then Jesus came into my heart. He helped me stop lying. He helped me give up drugs and drinking. He was making dramatic changes. And I knew his spirit was in my heart. I was hitchhiking from Palm Springs to Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, to visit my mother. On the way, this dignified lady picked me up. It was late at night, and uh, I didn't want to get out on the road, and, and I was amazed she picked me up because I looked pretty dangerous back then. And uh, she said, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I thought, well, I'm not sure what she meant by that. I said, well, I think so. She said, I said, you know, God's been helping me overcome sin and, and making so many changes, and he's given me a peace and a joy. She said, no, 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 I'm talking about that. She said, do you speak in tongues? And that kind of caught me off guard. I said, well, no. She said, oh, then you've not received the baptism. And because of the late hour, she said, we're going to have a Bible study. She took me back to her place and opened up her Bible and began to go through these scriptures and tell me how important it was for me to pray that I could speak in this heavenly tongue. And I was really confused. But, you know, it didn't seem right, and I resisted what she was saying. I've got friends who have visited some of these churches, and they say, we want to help you get the gift of tongues. So what you do is you come to the altar, and you say, hallelujah. My friend told me, he went to the altar, and he said, hallelujah. And they said, keep saying it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Faster. 
hallelujah, 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 faster. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. They said, you've got it. This is the gift of tongues. He said, come on. Now, they said, we're priming the spiritual pump. We're helping you loosen your tongue. And they've actually got biblical arguments how this is justified. You know, I have spent a lot of time, and I want to re reiterate, friends, there are a lot of friends of mine in these charismatic churches that practice this godly, loving, joyful people. As a matter of fact, there are some things we could learn as the traditional Christians from the charismatics about the importance of the Holy Spirit, about the joy of the Lord. There's some things we could learn. But this manifestation of the Holy Spirit and this babbling, I went to one church and I knelt down in a charismatic church and the lady next to me, I could hear her going, Honda Kawasaki Suzuki Yama, Honda Kawasaki Suzuki Yama, Honda Kawasaki Suzuki And I'm going, she's talking about Japanese motorcycles. And then the, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, and then the pastor comes over and he translates the message, thus saith the Lord. And he goes off with this, he says, this is actually a heavenly tongue. It sounds like Japanese motorcycles, but it's another language. Remember, I went to a church another time where whenever the preacher was preaching, halfway through the sermon, his wife would stand up. And she would go, Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami. Now, I don't mean to be disrespectful. That's exactly what she said over and over again. Same word, same phrase. Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami. And then she'd sit down. He'd say, oh, a message from the Lord. Thus say the Lord. And then he'd go on. He'd give this elaborate message. She might do that for 60 seconds. He'd preach for half an hour on what she had said. And she kept saying the same word. Every week she said the same word. But he had a different message every week. He said, I've got the heavenly understanding. This is the gift of interpretation. And he was interpreting the message. I'm going, wait a second. This is not the gift of tongues. I've got a friend who lived in India. He spoke Tamil, the language there. And for my Indian friends, Anivarakam Malivanakam. That's good evening, everybody. I told you I learned how to say hello in several languages. He went to one of these tent revivals where the pastor was going from individual to individual, translating people as they spoke in tongues. And my friend said, I want to see if this is real. And he went out there, and he began to say something in Tamil over and over again. The pastor came over. He said, oh, this sounds really good. And he said, thus saith the Lord. And he gave this long prophetic message. And my friend said, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, would you please pass the salt? Would you please pass the salt? Would you please pass the salt? And so you have to ask, is this really a heavenly tongue? You know where some of the confusion comes in? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. They say, this is the tongue of angels. Now, wait a second. Paul said, though, that means even if. Paul goes on to say, even if I give my body to be burned. He didn't. He was beheaded. He says, even if I have all faith. He did not have all faith. Only God has all faith. Even if I had all knowledge. He did not have all knowledge. He's saying, even if I spoke with the tongues of men and angels and had not love, it would be like sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Paul never said he spoke with the tongue of angels. He's saying to the Corinthians, you're doing all these tongues and you don't realize if you don't love each other, tongues are a waste. Many people think the fruit of the Spirit is tongues. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is not the gifts of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace. And so many of my charismatic friends, all they want to know is, do you have the gift of the Spirit? And they go to the bottom of the list, and they say, do you speak in tongues? Something's wrong, friends. And this is not what traditional Christians believe. This is not what Bible Christians believe for 900 years, for 1900 years. This has become popular in many Christian churches just in the last 90 or 100 years. And I want to tell you that you cannot support it biblically. Let's find out more about what the Bible says. What was one of the main characteristics of ancient Babylon? It says, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. That's where the word babbling comes from. At the Tower of Babel, God confounded the languages. At Pentecost, God reversed the curse. He gave them the ability to speak other languages that the church might be one. You see, they were scattered at Babylon because they were making their own religion in defiance to God. At Pentecost, it was not confusion. It was understanding that the Spirit brought. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. And you walk in some of these churches and it's like a hootenanny. Everybody's babbling and dancing and kicking and the drums are going and it's just like chaos and bedlam and they say, this is the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what, friends, I'll give them credit. Sometimes you go and it's invigorating. I'll give them that. And it's entertaining. I've been to some of these churches and I may not get anything out of the Word, but I don't go to sleep. <laughs> I've seen people sleeping during my sermons, but boy, some of these churches, you know, folks are falling down and rolling and, and that's where you get the word holy rollers because this, they used to 
be fringe churches in North America. And they, the, the mainline churches laughed at them and looked down on them. Now it's all mainline, including Catholic and Protestant. The Catholics have a whole branch that's spreading like wildfire. The charismatic Catholics and charismatic Protestants. It's now in the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterian churches. And it's not biblical. And it's the glue that's going to weld together this final movement, the misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. What's the name on her forehead? Babylon. And what was one of the chief characteristics of ancient Babylon? They babbled at the Tower of Babel. It's a characteristic of fallen Babylon today. It represents confusion. Don't forget Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. I left out the last part of that. Anyway, out of the mouth of the uh, beast, dragon, and false prophet. Three unclean spirits like frogs. Where's a frog's weapon? It's tongue. Nobody's ever been attacked and bitten by a frog. It's the tongues. And the tongues go to all three of these uh, powers, last powers that form a solidarity against God's people. You may say, Doug, where did this come from? How did it migrate into the Christian church? As with all counterfeits, it happens slowly in an insidious, very slow way. Let me give you a little history. Have you heard about the Oracle of Delphi? Anybody here? Look it up in the encyclopedia. Back, way back before the time of Christ, in Delphi, Greece, and there's a picture, they had some rocks from which emitted volcanic vapors. A Greek pagan priestess called a Sybil, S-Y-B-I-L, that's where the name comes from, she would go to the vapors and she would inhale them. She would go into a trance and begin muttering and babbling. They called it the language of the gods. The priest would then come along and translate these oracles, these messages from the gods, and there were always very nebulous, vague messages that never could give you any definite guidance. And uh, it was called the Oracle of Delphi. This practice of people going into a trance-like state and babbling and the language of the gods, in voodoo, they have the very same thing. They beat drums, they go into a trance, they speak the language of the spirits, they call it. You have this practice in many pagan religions around the world. Well, you know, it migrated into many of the Christian churches back in the late 1890s. And again, at first it was laughed at, but you know, the devil has a way of making counterfeits look genuine. Gradually, the genuine gift of tongues began to be supplemented or overshadowed by the counterfeit. Now, I believe I've received the gift of tongues, the, the real thing. And now, you know, we've got some translators in the back. They've got the gift of tongues, but most of them have learned English in their different languages. I think I got it in a miraculous way. I was driving one day from Demi, New Mexico to uh, California. I was going from Texas to California. In Demi, New Mexico, I'm pulling this old truck, 54 Chevy truck, pulling a big old 20-foot trailer, putting along 45 miles an hour by myself, bored. Radio didn't even work. And I said, Lord, please give me someone to witness to. I always pick up hitchhikers because I used to hitchhike. And you, you breaks up the monotony. You talk to somebody. Right after I prayed, God answered my prayer. There was a gentleman on the side of the road, a Latin gentleman. I stopped and picked him up. He was freezing because it was the middle of winter and all he had on was a dress shirt and jeans. And so I turned on the heat and I said, is that better? And he said, como? <laughs> I said, um, you warm? And I turned up the heat and uh, I tried to talk to him and I found out he didn't speak a lick of English. I did learn his name was Omar. The extent of my Spanish was burrito, enchilada, uno, dos, tres. And uh, I thought, Lord, you've got a sense of humor. I asked for someone to witness to, and he doesn't speak English, and I don't really speak Spanish. I took it in elementary school, and I flunked. And um, I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. And so as we drove along, I first I thought, Spanish is kind of like English. You just put O at the end of your words. <laughs> and it said, I'm going to drive on my truck -o <laughs> to my <laughs> to my homo up in <laughs> California. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And then I thought maybe he was hungry. And I said, you want some dinero? <laughs> Meaning dinner. And he said, well, yeah, you know, that's money in Spanish. And uh, 
then I said, this isn't working. And so I said, Lord, give me the ability to speak his language. I said, I'd like to share the gospel with him. I said, Lord, if ever a person needed the gift of tongues, I need it now. You know, friends, I don't know how it happened or when it happened, but somewhere along the way, gradually, words began to come to me. And I'm not kidding. They just began to come to me. And I began to, to guess. And they were right. I mean, I gave up the, putting the O and the A at the end of everything. <laughs> Sometimes that worked. It just fell in that way. But I, I began to just guess. And he started understanding. He started talking to me. And I understood what he was saying. He said he was looking for trabajo, for work. And I said, yo vivo en la montaña, arriba, norte de California. And, and he's, he's looking at me like, oh, my God. He said, tu quieres trabajo conmigo? And, and I wasn't perfect, but he understood. He came and lived with me in Northern California, was baptized, and God gave me the ability to speak. And I just got a letter from him a few weeks ago. He's living back in Mexico, and he's, the Lord is still working in his life. But uh, from that day to this day, Yo no sé de cómo predico en español, pero yo comprendo más palabras si tú hablas despacio. Some of you are lento. So the Lord gave me this ability, but why did he do it? He, other people who heard me talking to Omar thought I was babbling, but he understood what I was saying. See what I'm saying? And so the gift of tongues is for the purpose of spreading the gospel. That's the genuine gift. This is what happened to the apostles in the early days of the church. God doesn't keep giving the gift that way when we've got translators available who understand the language. You understand? He does it when there's no other way. It's a supernatural gift, but he still does it. Notice what Paul says here. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. And I know a lot of people that say, Oh, Doug, it's so liberating. I pray in tongues, and I feel it. Don't forget that. The emphasis is on the feeling. What does Paul mean here? For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Paul is not saying that he prays, and he doesn't know what he's praying, because if you pray and you don't know what you're praying, that's not prayer. You don't know what you're asking for. You're never going to know if you get it. That's not prayer, friends, right? The Bible says God knows what things you ask, what things you need before you even ask him. So this notion that you're praying in a language, you don't know what you're saying, but it feels good and you don't know what you're getting, that's not prayer. Paul is saying, if I pray in an unknown tongue, a tongue that is unknown to those present, I might pray in the Holy Spirit and my understanding is fruitful to me, but it's unfruitful to you. I understand. My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. The understood subject is to those present. Read the whole chapter. He's talking about not speaking in another language when those present do not understand what you're saying. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech I just said a Jewish prayer. I bet not too many of you know what I said. I prayed in the spirit, but it was unfruitful. My prayer in the spirit was unfruitful to you. See what I'm saying? That's all Paul's saying. The Corinthian church was a melting pot of people from all over the world. Their services were becoming a confusing Babylon. Paul was saying, do not speak unless those present understand. I think it's time for us to sing a little song, don't you? Okay, you're going to recognize this. I want you to just join in with me, okay? Come on. You don't recognize it? Really? Is my playing that bad? All right, how about this? You know what it is? I only played a few notes and you recognize it, right? Wait a second, I'm not done yet. I'm going to try and get all of this in I can because it helps you remember. Sing along. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know that one? <laughs> now why am I doing that? Open your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 14. Paul tells us back in Bible times they did not have radios. They communicated in their battles using trumpets. When I went to military school, every morning on the PA we heard, 
No, that was in the evening we heard that. In the morning we heard That means reveille, get up. The trumpets had signals. Notice here in verse 9 or in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 14, for if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare to the battle? So likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? You're speaking into the air. Friends, if you're going to speak, God wants us to be understood. Is that clear? Amen. The purpose for the gift of languages is to communicate thought. If you're babbling, you are not communicating thought. Does the Spirit fill those who deliberately break God's commandments? John 14, 15, what does Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter, even the spirit of truth. Acts 5.32, what did the disciples say about the importance of receiving the spirit in obedience? The Holy Ghost, whom God has given to those that obey him. And a lot of these people who have had the Holy Spirit, when they hear the word of God about the Sabbath commandment and they reject it, they may find they're grieving away the Holy Spirit. They had it before because God winked at their ignorance, but now they know. And if they continue to sin willfully after they know the truth, that's very dangerous, friends. You know, I think it's interesting that a number of these charismatic ministers that uh, travel around the world and have these mega meetings, they claim they have the gift of tongues, and many of them have been discovered to be disobeying God. It's filled the headlines that some of them were unfaithful to their spouses, they were stealing money, and you know, all the time they were doing that, they were babbling on TV. When they travel overseas, if they've got the gift of tongues, why do they take an army of translators with them? Paul emphasized that we should desire which spiritual gift? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4 and 5, He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that prophesieth, that means preaches, edifies the church. Greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaks in a tongue. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. For as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you might excel to the edifying of the church. To edify means to build up, edificio in Spanish, amen? What's the main reason and why does God fill people with his spirit? So they can babble? Acts 1.8. But you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. God gives you power to live the Christian life. That's why it came at uh, baptism. When you commit your life to the Lord, you need that power, amen? Not only to live the life, but to share the life, to be his witnesses. And Acts 4.31, it says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. It says nothing about tongues, because this time when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, Everyone there understood the language. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We need to listen to what the Spirit says, right? Is it possible to tell whether a person, whether or not a person has been filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we tell? Matthew 7, 20. Do we tell by the gifts of the Spirit, like tongues, or by the what? Wherefore, wherefore by their fruits shall you know them. So many people say, show me you've got the Spirit by babbling or by tongues. No, Jesus said you show by the fruits. And some people attempt to counterfeit the fruits. You don't make an apple tree, an orange tree, by taping an orange on an apple tree. You need the fruits in your life. If you want to show me you've got the Holy Spirit, don't babble, love your enemy. Amen? That's evidence that you've got the Holy Spirit. Number 18, how can I receive? How can I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How many of you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Here's the answer. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that what? Yes. Friends, if ever there was a time when God's people needed God's Spirit, it's now. Would you like to ask God to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit? Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Heaven is real. It's not a theory. God did not design people to die. There'll be no garbage trucks. There'll be no banks. Because nobody's going to steal, and you won't need any money. What are you going to buy? Everybody's loving and outgiving each other, right? You know, if the devil was cast out for sinning, we're not going in that way. We must allow the Lord to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. journey back through time 
to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation of evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. If you've been encouraged by today's message and would like to know more of what God's Word says to you today, Amazing Facts invites you to visit our educational website at www.bibleuniverse.com. At Bible Universe, you'll discover exciting truths that will fill you with peace and purpose. The mysteries of the Bible will unfold for you at your own pace. Visit www.bibleuniverse.com today. Expand your universe. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org. The Bible speaks about several spiritual gifts throughout the New Testament that God has given to His people. But the gift of tongues is only mentioned a few times in the New Testament. In spite of this, there's an explosion throughout the Christian world regarding this particular gift. So what does the gift of tongues really mean? Some within the church identify the gift of tongues as a spiritual conversion or even a test of faith. How does the Bible identify the gift of tongues? And what is its purpose within the church today? We have prepared a wonderful pocketbook that will help answer these and many other questions. It's called Understanding Tongues. You'll be blessed as this study resource reveals what we should expect from the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues. Call the toll-free number and ask for offer number 145. Or you can visit our website at amazingfacts.org. You can also write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 145, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have today for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until next time, friends, remember these words of Jesus in John 8, 38, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen, and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. Preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. They were prophesying. That means they were preaching. They understood what they were saying. You see what I'm saying? In all three examples, when they got the gift of tongues, they recognized that they were speaking, either magnifying God, the wonderful works of God, or prophesying for God, but they understood what was being said. They weren't just there babbling words over and over again. What does the Bible say about speaking in a tongue that is not understood by those that are present? Uh, you'd think that as much as it's done, that God would endorse it. But what does Paul really say in 1 Corinthians 14? Except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words. The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... The unforgivable sin is the sin that God cannot forgive because you've lost the ability to repent. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. 
We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. Running around naked up in the mountains with long hair and a beard, eating out of a garbage can, using drugs, cursing, stealing, lying, living immorally. Then Jesus came into my heart. He helped me stop lying. He helped me give up drugs and drinking. He was making dramatic changes. And I knew his spirit was in my heart. I was hitchhiking from Palm Springs to Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, to visit my mother. On the way, this dignified lady picked me up. It was late at night, and uh, I didn't want to get out on the road, and, and I was amazed she picked me up because I looked pretty dangerous back then. And uh, she said, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I thought, well, I'm not sure what she meant by that. I said, well, I think so. She said, I said, you know, God's been helping me overcome sin and, and making so many changes, and he's given me a peace and a joy. She said, no, 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 I'm talking about that. What does the word prophesied mean? Prophesied does not mean you're forecasting the weather or telling the future, guessing, you know, where Elvis is next going to appear, like some of the supermarket tabloid prophets. Prophecy, one of the words is to preach. In the New Testament, keep in mind, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14, Prophecy does not always mean saying, thus saith the Lord, and foretelling the future. Prophecy means to speak in behalf of another or to preach the gospel for Christ, okay? Now, with that in mind, what does the Bible say about speaking in a tongue? No, with that in mind, these 12 Ephesian disciples, Luke is there, he speaks one language. Paul is there, he speaks other languages. Then there's 12 Ephesian believers there. There's several language groups represented. When they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke with tongues in an unknown tongue. Now, if that's clear to you, let me hear you say amen. amen. He's, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians, if you're going to talk, make sure those present understand. The reason this is close to my heart, incidentally, this is the first time this lesson has ever been presented publicly. I wrote this lesson because it's a real critical need in the church. There's a lot of confusion. You've probably seen how the gift of tongues and some of the misunderstandings about it are just spreading like fire through all the churches, all the mainline churches. And people kind of sometimes look at you like you're a second-class citizen if you cannot do this babbling in tongues that they call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After I accepted the Lord up in my cave, God was working mightily in my life. Remember, when he found me, I was about as far away from God as a person can get. 